Hello, everybody. Uh, we are very happy to be with you today. Uh, this is one of the activities of the International League Against Epilepsy. Today, we will discuss a very important topic uh, about uh, the combinations of uh, epilepsy and some behavioral disorders in children, including mainly the ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And our speaker today will be uh, Dr. Gillian Reardon, a senior specialist uh, in pediatric neurology in Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital in Cape Town. She's a clinician and she's involved predominantly in ambulatory care for patients with neurological problems, especially those patients with epilepsy and ADHD. And she has long standing interest in these two conditions. And she has worked closely with uh, child psychiatry and initiated a joint clinic to assist those patients and managing comorbidities in children with ADHD. She did few private practice sessions focused mainly on ADHD. We are very curious to listen from her and we will give her the chance right now. Please, Dr. Gillian. Good evening, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, thank you all for being here tonight, or, or maybe it's a bit earlier than tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about comorbidities um, in epilepsy, and, and I'm sure that all of us who work in the field are aware that when we're managing patients with epilepsy, it's not so much the epilepsy sometimes that causes us trouble, but it is the number of comorbidities that we have to pay attention to as well. So what I'm going to do is have a look at the epidemiology of epilepsy-related comorbidities then focus on a few of the specific comorbidities, consider the epilepsy syndromes and what roles they play. There are a number of common genetic conditions, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which also have particular um, comorbidities. And then at the end, we're going to consider um, what our management options might be. All right, so a comorbidity a comorbidity is a, a greater than coincidental presence of two conditions in the same individual. So these disorders might co-occur by chance, or they could share genetic, environmental, or other mechanisms. This isn't a new um, a new thought. Hippocrates had the thought long before us, more than 2,000 years ago, and he said to have written that melancholics ordinarily become epileptics and epileptics melancholics. So making us consider that there's a bi-directional system that links epilepsy and in this case uh, melancholy or depression. All right, so there have been many studies looking at um, epidemiology and children with epilepsy are at very high risk of comorbidities. 80% have at least one comorbidity as found in a, a very large um, registry-based study in, in Norway of over 6,000 children. So one comorbidity could be anything. It could be constipation or gastroesophageal reflux, but behavioral and cognitive um, comorbidities were present in 23 to 34%. There are a number of predisposing factors. We know that preschool onset of seizures and, and seizures starting in infancy are more likely to be associated with comorbidities later on. We also know that if there's a unifying underlying cause like cerebral palsy, that may give rise both to epilepsy as well as to other comorbidities. We recognize that certain specific epilepsy syndromes are associated with comorbidities, that seizure localization may play a role, and that seizure frequency is important. There is a lot of thought about EEG abnormalities and what, how interictal EEG abnormalities may affect comorbidity. 
And then we must always consider our treatment choice and the impact of the treatments that we choose. So there, these are complicating concepts. Um, as I mentioned, cerebral palsy is a global condition which gives rise to both epilepsy as well as intellectual disability and perhaps behavioral disturbances as well. A number of the epilepsy syndromes themselves give rise to seizures as well as behavioral abnormalities. And then there are all sorts of additional complications. So the side effects of medication, and in our setting also, the effects of the general nutrition of the children, whether they've got any chronic infections like HIV or TB, what their general health is and what their social challenges are. So there are an enormous number of factors that we have to consider when we are treating our patients with epilepsy. And we always need to look and see what there is that is reversible. These are the common comorbidities that most of us would recognize. ADHD probably tops the list, then autism, developmental and cognitive disabilities, depression and anxiety, sleep disorders, accidental injuries, and migraine. Canna did a very large study with a, a, a group of um, co authors from around the world. This is based mainly in the States, the UK and, and Europe, um, and encompassed more than a million subjects. So it was a large, large um, study that looked at more than 14 sort of registries of population. And with these numbers, these are the figures that came up. So depression, this is not children with epilepsy, this is everyone with epilepsy. So um, you can see the order of magnitude um, that depression, anxiety, psychosis, and ADHD were prevalent in, in epilep patients with epilepsy compared to those in the general population. And another large study from Italy looking at uh, 200 children and 1,000 adults with epilepsy found that at least a quarter of them had one more comorbidity or more. And these were very variable. So they could be developmental, they could be psychiatric, and presumably many of the older adults had cardiovascular or endocrine and metabolic defects. So we know that etiologically, some of our children have genetic problems that give rise to cardiovascular abnormalities or metabolic disturbances. So there are a lot of interlinked conditions in these patients that we're treating. Riley looked at neurobehavioral comorbidities in children with active epilepsy. So this was a community-based study done in the UK for a much smaller group of 85 children. But in this little group, in the community, 40% had intellectual disability. So that would be categorized as an IQ of less than 70. A borderline IQ would be less than 85. A third had ADHD and 21% had ASD. So these are not children attending specialized tertiary hospital clinics. These are, are children with epilepsy being managed in the community. What was important about this study was that only a third were previously recognized to have behavioral difficulties. And this emphasizes the need for active screening for neurobehavioral comorbidities as part of standard patient care. So are there studies from our part of the world? Well, I'm from the tip of Africa, but Africa is an enormous continent. And I'm just going to list three studies from Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. Um, this one performed in Northern Tanzania looked at a lot, which was a longitudinal follow-up study of children with epilepsy compared with a con control group. And these children had more behavioral difficulties and cognitive impairment than controls quite significantly. So almost half of the children with epilepsy had behavior problems versus just about 14% of controls. What was interesting and rewarding was that the behavior improved when they reduced seizure frequency. But what was very worrying, and I think this is a, a, a big issue in our circumstances, is that 49 out of 103 children with epilepsy were not attending school. And this is for multiple reasons, but I'm sure many people listening, this will, this will echo with them. And um, it is something that's extremely worrying. 
The study looked at epilepsy in Kenyan children, also looked at the neurobehavioral comorbidities there. And very similarly, when one looks at the odds ratios compared with controls, you can see that there are significantly higher proportions of children suffering from ADHD, autism spectrum, and cognitive impairments in the children with epilepsy compared with the controlled children. So again, their conclusion was that a comprehensive management plan for neurobehavioral comorbidities should be incorporated into standard epilepsy care. The Ugandan study had similar findings, 300 children, 6 to 17 years, and behavioral problems in over 30%. All right, so let's look at the specific comorbidities, ADHD and epilepsy. 12 to 20% of ADHD is, is roughly what they find in population registries of children with epilepsy, but it goes up to 30 to 40% in targeted studies and children with severe epilepsy. There's a sense that it may even be underdiagnosed and the deficits like inattention attributed to epilepsy or to an anti-seizure medication. And I think everyone can relate to that when you're taking a history about a child who has um, perhaps absence epilepsy or uh, another type of epilepsy, one wonders how much of the inattention is because of epilepsy and how much is because of inattention primarily. The other interesting thing this is unlike um, the usual ADHD, the male-female ratio in children with epilepsy who have ADHD is pretty much equal. And the other thing that's a little bit different is that inattention is more common than in children who don't have epilepsy who have ADHD. So, the International League Against Epilepsy did, had a task force looking at the comorbidities and looking at the screening, diagnosis, and management of ADHD in children with epilepsy. This was published in Epilepsia in June 2018, and it's a, an excellent um, paper to refer to. Um, they found, indeed, this, they confirmed this bidirectional relationship between ADHD and epilepsy, with ADHD being two and a half times more common in children with epilepsy than controls, and epilepsy being almost four times more common in children with ADHD than control children without ADHD. There was no difference in the prevalence between boys and girls, as I mentioned. They also found that with polytherapy, there was increased incidence of ADHD, that valparate was associated with inattention, and that if epilepsy wasn't controlled, the comorbidities were increased. ADHD become, reached levels of 30 to 40 percent, and autism tics and oppositional defiant disorder all became more common. What was really important was that they noted that methylphenidate could be beneficial in 61 percent of patients without any deterioration in seizure control. All right, moving on to autism, another very common comorbidity. And the prevalence of epilepsy in autism spectrum is around about 8%, and it's more prevalent in those children with autism who have intellectual disability. We know that there are an, an, a large number of genes linked to autism spectrum, so three or 400, and that at least half of these are involved in synaptic plasticity, impacting on brain connectivity. Some of them influence the balance of GABA and glutamate, which is important in the pathogenesis of epilepsy. Genetic syndromes associated with autism spectrum include the well-known fragile X, tuberous sclerosis, and early onset encephalopathies. So there are a couple of hypotheses about how to understand the relationship between epilepsy and ASD. Um, one could consider that if you have a genetic mutation, which causes aberrant brain development by either causing an imbalance of excitation inhibition or causing migrational abnormalities or a channelopathy. This could give rise both to seizures as well as to autism and cognitive impairment. Alternatively, early seizures can themselves result in aberrant brain development 
which then may give rise to autism spectrum and cognitive impairment. So the links between them are complex. They tend to start early on and they are multi, they are multi, multi causal. All right, so anxiety and depression become very, very important when we move into the adolescent age group. Um, and here they are frighteningly high. So anyone dealing with adolescence really needs to, to um, consider what um, is necessary to screen for these conditions. Depression is present in about a quarter of adolescents, anxiety similarly up to a third, and suicidal ideation has been found to be frighteningly high. Again, there seems to be some sort of bidirectional, tridirectional association between these disorders. Um, this is another UK GP database study, so <clears throat> more of a community study uh, with 14,000 controls and over 3,000 patients with epilepsy. And epilepsy was associated both before and after diagnosis with increased global anxiety disorder, depression, psychosis, and suicide. This suggested a common underlying pathophysiological mechanism which lowers the seizure threshold and increases the risk for psychiatric disorders and suicide. The International League um, looked at man the management of depression and anxiety in people with epilepsy and did a survey of epilepsy health professionals in Australia. So it's a sort of a um, questionnaire and What's interesting here, and I think most of us can relate, is that less than half felt adequately resourced to manage these comorbidities. Um, the, num the amount of time one needs and the amount of um, experience one needs to adequately manage um, a, a number of psychiatric comorbidities is quite considerable. There was a lack of consensus about which health professionals were responsible for screening and management. And it was apparent that there were ongoing barriers to mental health care, including a lack of trained mental health specialists and a lack of standardized procedures. Future directions include a need for updated protocols and the integration of mental health professionals within epilepsy settings. This diagram shows from the same survey who the um, those doctors who were surveyed felt were responsible for screening on the left and whom they thought were responsible for management on the right. So you can see in your, this, this because this was a, a general study, it wasn't particularly pediatric. It's seen neurologists in the sort of reddish block, epileptologists in the pink block, psychiatrists in the pale blue, psychologists in the orange, and GPs in the purple. <clears throat> and um, so there's a, there's a slight difference between the two. So the neurologists were felt they could do the screening in about 30%, but management dropped to about 20%, whereas psychiatrists weren't really responsible for screening, but took on a lot of the management of these comorbidities. Psychologists and GPs and epileptologists seem to manage them more or less equally, screening and management. Um, but when one looks at this diagram, um, this looks at the frequency of screening practices. So depression on the left, anxiety in the middle and suicide on the right. And the pale blue is when patients were screened at the initial visit and at every follow up visit. So you can see that depression and anxiety, the two charts look almost identical. So people are comfortable about screening for those. And a lot of people screen a like two fifth screen um, at every visit and the, the orange block was at in the beginning at least once a year. If you look at the suicide um, pie diagram on the right, you can see that it's mostly taken up by the orange and the orange is only if um, the, the patient or the relative spontaneously reports symptoms. So this is a concern because it's very easy not to go there when you're sitting in a, a busy room and you've got lots of patients waiting not to ask the questions. And I think the suicide questions are particularly difficult to ask. And 
there are probably lots of um, thoughts about this that we may not be able to entirely explore because I'm sure there are cultural issues regarding this kind of questioning. But it is really important because the risks are there and the evidence doesn't seem to suggest that there are big differences wherever in the world you're practicing. All right, so moving on to epilepsy syndromes and behavioral phenotypes associated with them. And I'm sure all of you will find yourselves very familiar with these. So the, the sort of common and what we think of as relatively benign types of epilepsy. So self-limited um, epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes and childhood absence epilepsy. These are healthy children usually going to mainstream schools whom we regard as being minimally affected and hopefully easily controlled on medication. Um, this study by Jones did show that the children with epilepsy still had higher rates of psychiatric and behavior problems, although their IQ remained stable over time. Their psychiatric symptoms remained elevated over time. When one comes to the developmental and the epileptic encephalopathies, we tend to expect that we're going to encounter problems. So we recognize that cognitive delay and intellectual disability are going to be occur very frequently in this group, in the Otohara, the West syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and in Oxgastro. Dravet with the fever triggered prolonged seizures starting in the first year, 80% of which are SCN1A related. The cognitive course seems to worsen with time. So the study looking at 67 patients found little correlation between the IQ and the epilepsy data. So even if we do diagnose Drave early, um, treat them on the appropriate precision medicine um, and control their seizures, we don't necessarily interrupt the course of their um, behavioral and intellectual progress. Although myoclonus and focal seizures are associated with lower DQ and IQ. Um, so this suggests that encephalopathy is not a pure consequence of the epilepsy and the SCN1A variant plays an additional direct role. In the Dusa syndrome or myoclonic atonic epilepsy, what we found, and I'd be interested to know if others have found the same thing because this isn't widely documented, the behavior often becomes extremely hyperactive early on and very oppositional, in fact, very difficult to treat. And the outcome varies widely from normal cognition to severe delay. Um, and so we think cognitive impairment may be related to increased episodes of status, um, perhaps long periods before children were treated in, in, in some settings, and then medically refractory seizures and, and resistance to the ketogenic diet. So with appropriate intervention, usually you would expect quite a good outcome in up to 80% of patients. JME is also another type of epilepsy that's thought to be relatively easy to control and, and benign. But this study looked <clears throat> quite interestingly at risk-taking behavior and impulsivity in adolescents with JME versus control. So adolescents are a risk-taking group to start with, but they compared their, their performance on the Iowa gambling task and they used functional MRI um, to complete a working memory task to correlate activation patterns and compared them with controls. And they found that JME with ongoing seizures, children with JME who had ongoing seizures, learned significantly less from previous experience. Whereas if they were seizure free, there was really no difference between them and the controls. So that's interesting because it suggests that somehow interictal dysfunction in these normal working memory networks affects the ability to specifically learn. Frontal lobe epilepsy and ADHD, I think we probably would um, associate as a fairly common co-occurrence. Um, and again, it seems to be an association here with excessive abnormal discharges where the prevalence of ADHD was much higher in the order of 90% compared to those who had a normal EEG at 25%. All right, genetic syndromes where epilepsy is not the primary disorder. 
tuberous sclerosis complex. In tuberous sclerosis, we have seizures in about 80% of cases, uh, starting with infantile spasms and an overall incidence of intellectual disability of about 40%. Autism ranges from 30 to 60%. And then um, you may all have heard of tanned tuberous sclerosis associated neuropsychiatric disorders. So there, tuberous sclerosis is a genetic condition that's really well characterized in terms of behavioral comorbidity and they get ADHD, they're aggressive, they get sleep disturbances, they're anxious and depressed at times. And since the um, discovery that of the mTOR pathway and the interventions that have become possible in, again, applying some precision medicine. Um, there have been some small studies looking at mTOR inhibitors and epilepsy. And the questions that have been asked are, can these mTOR inhibitors affect not only SEGA, but are they useful in other features of tuberous sclerosis? So this was a small study from quite long ago, 2014, and there've been a number of updates. Um, but they looked, these seven children all had quite refractory seizures and were given sirolimus or everolimus. And they all had... Um, sorry, shall, shall I carry on? I, yes, please. Welcome oh, sorry. back. Uh, okay, Thank sorry, you. I'm not quite sure what happened <laughs> yes, there. <sorry>. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So, in Fragile X, 30% of males meet the criteria for autistic disorder, and the uh, FMRP. Um, gene interacts or protein interacts with proteins implicated in autism. 10 to sorry. 25. Yeah, sorry. Can you share your screen, please? Share your uh, screen again. Uh, sorry, let me go back. Okay, so. Is that, is that shared now? Great, great. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Fragile in fragile X, 30% of males meet the criteria for autistic disorder. FMRP interacts with proteins implicated in autism. And 10 to 25% of patients have epilepsy, which is often quite easily controlled. Those with epilepsy are more likely to have ASD. And there's been some interest in GABAergic drugs for the use of epilepsy and for targeting abnormal expression of GABA receptors in this group of patients. Um, this slide simply demonstrates the overlap in comorbidities in fragile X with autism and epilepsy. And then lastly, Rett syndrome, which I think um, we realize has a very specific phenotype that combines um, developmental delay, epilepsy, and some behaviors that are, are really peculiar to Rett syndrome and help us to recognize it and make the diagnosis. So this is an area of ongoing interest <clears throat> in terms of possible interventions. So how do we improve outcomes in these children? Studies have shown that the earlier we screen and intervene, the more likely we are to have a positive outcome. 
So Guilfoyle looked at psychological comorbidities in youth with new onset epilepsy and compared them with those who had chronic epilepsy. And the chronic group had significantly higher depressive symptoms. So he recommended proactive screening to ensure timeliest recognition and interventions. We do have to be aware of the impact of our anti-seizure medications and to see whether they are responsible for any of the behavioral problems that the, the patient is experiencing. The anti-seizure medicines approved before 1938 didn't go through substantive human trial safety data. So these include phenobarbital and phenytoin, both of which are really widely used, especially in under-resourced settings. We know that phenobarb is responsible for marked hyperactivity in children, um, even though it is able to control seizures. It's not ideal for cognitive, for cognitive outcomes. The agents released after 1993 received the most rigorous clinical trial evaluation and are well documented. If we look at ASMs with GABAergic effects, um, they're most important when it comes to psychiatric and behavioral side effects, some of which are positive and some of which are not. So the barbiturates and benzodiazepines, as I've mentioned, predominantly have negative behavior and depression. But some of our other sodium channel blockers, um, sodium channel active agents like carbamazepine and, and lamotrigine have very positive behavioral side effects. And uh, the two of those, as well as valproic acid, are widely used in psychiatry to assist with um, mood stabilization. So ask the obvious questions and reverse the reversible. Somehow find the time to make sure you have an accurate epilepsy diagnosis and are using an appropriate anti-seizure medicine. Screen for comorbidities, even if it takes time and you can't do it all in one session. Um, think about in your practice, what screening would suit you best, what checklists are available, how it would work, whether you could utilize the nurse while the patients are waiting to see you. Um, but even if you introduce a very basic quick screen, it's better than, than no screening at all. We really need to pay attention to sleep, diet, social, medical, and pain needs in all of our children. Um, I think particularly in, in areas that are under-resourced because many of those are definitely areas where we can intervene and make a difference. And then utilize a team approach wherever possible. Consider the safety of your patients and caregiver continuity when one's working with behavioral histories is, is really helpful. So getting feedback and, and giving um, advice to um, the same person is, is very helpful. So treatment should be individualized and our treatment goals are to have optimal seizure control as well as optimal physical and cognitive function. Use the simplest possible anti-seizure medicine regime and promote the use of anti-seizure medicines, which could assist with comorbid conditions. Recommend formal neuropsychiatric evaluation if that is available. <clears throat> and then I think we all understand that parents with children who have epilepsy are on a journey. So at the first visit, there is only so much information that a parent can take in. They're usually extremely anxious and they usually don't hear much more than the diagnosis. They're often very frightened to hear the word epilepsy. So the process is one of um, walking with the patient, supporting them, helping them understand the etiology, trying to achieve seizure management, getting them to understand the consequences of the seizures and understand the, medic the, the medications, the efficacy and the adverse effects, and then giving them support in pointing out a point of contact for crisis. Later on, it's going to evolve into a, a time when you're maintaining seizure control, you're working with the psychiatric and behavioral comorbidities and educational challenges. You're dealing perhaps with loss of hope and acceptance and coping with changes in family relationships. And again, trying to get access as early as possible to therapeutic resources and assessments for comorbidities. So we've only talked about anxiety and depression in patients in this talk, but it's very, very prevalent in parents as well, and particularly in the primary caregiver, because the burden of care <clears throat> for a, a, a parent or a caregiver uh, of a child with multiple comorbidities is very high. And then <clears throat> as time goes by, um, one is managing progressive neurological symptoms, um, 
one needs to consider a behavioral management plan, uh, deal with various social issues, and of course, transition, deal with a transition plan from pediatric care um, to adult care and plans for education milestones and care coordination. So it is a huge amount of input that one takes on when one's managing any individual epilepsy patient. And I think we're well aware that we, we need energy, we need resources, we need enthusiasm, but I think with planning, we can achieve much. And it's very often that the comorbidities are what is limiting the patient. So we mustn't stop at just treating the epilepsy. We really need to push on. <clears throat> Methylphenidate is safe for ADHD and epilepsy. Multidisciplinary teams should assess comorbidities in children with epilepsy to improve care and outcomes. And please remember to ask beyond the epilepsy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reardon, for this very interesting topic. Really, uh, it touches very important point in practice. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to tell the attendees that uh, they can put their questions about the topic in the, in the box of Q&A, and uh, we will try to, to answer it uh, uh, right now. But first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Reardon about your talk. Thank you so much. I would like to ask you something, please, if it's possible to uh, uh, the, the high rate of association or the comorbidities of uh, epilepsy and ADHD. Do you think that is it valuable for the clinician to have a routine EEG for any child with ADHD or other behavioral disorder, even if there is no history of specific epileptic seizures or something like that? Uh, personally, I don't think so. I think that's uh, in a resource limited setting that would really be excessive. I think even in in uh, countries that are well resourced, that's probably not um, recommended. But what I do think is important is that the history taking is very careful. So um, I would, cons you know, you often get referred children with um, inattention uh, for school going children. So you, with a good history, one can usually be fairly confident that you've excluded absence epilepsy, which is the obvious comorbidity. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you need a routine EEG for that if you really don't feel convinced by the history that it is absence um, I, I don't think so. So I don't do that in my practice. Um, I think I'd be overloading our, um, if, if we just look at the overall incidence, we have about a million children in each age group. So if I were to refer 6% of them with ADHD for EEGs, I think our, our labs would not be able to cope. Be so difficult. no, I think one's got to focus really on it, on taking a very good history and only do it if, if you are concerned, you know, if, there, if there's some features in the history that make you worried. But do you prefer the use of uh, uh, sodium channel blockers when using uh, treatment or anti-seizure medication for those patients with comorbid epilepsy and ADHD specifically? So my choice of anti-seizure medication actually depends on what the, the etiology of the seizures is. So I would, I would focus first of all on, on, on the seizure, what the cause of the seizures was. If, if a, a sodium channel was appropriate, I would use it. But uh, sometimes it's not appropriate. Sometimes it might make the child worse. So I think you have to go with the uh, agent you have available to you that's most appropriate for the epilepsy. And then if that does cause side effects, um, change it. So I didn't mention with Valparate the side effect of obesity, but that's really, really common. And I think it's very important. And we probably, as pediatricians, um, don't pay enough attention to, to childhood obesity and it leads to long-term morbidity in, in adulthood. So there are very many situations where we do use drugs that we know have comorbidities. Um, I think one of the problems is the constraints of not always having a good alternative. So um, not everyone has access to levetiracetam, uh, for instance. But ideally, we would we would 
start the, the treatment we thought was appropriate um, and then be guided by watching the comorbidities when we follow up our patients and making changes if we need to. I think we start to have some questions in Q&A. Some um, Dr. Sachin, he is asking about the after hemispherectomy, what outcome is most probably shows cognitive decline or not? Um, I beg your pardon, after? After, after hemispherectomy. Oh, hemispherectomy. Yeah. Um, sorry, after the outcome, hemispherectomy? The outcome is most probably to show, the outcome is uh, the, this child will have cognitive decline or not. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's a separate subject really, but with hemispherectomy, um, the earlier one can do it, the, best, the, the better the outcome is likely to be. So most of the evidence is that if you can do it as early as possible, the chance for synaptic plasticity is, is greatest. But obviously, um, in very, very tiny babies, you need to have a very experienced team to do it safely. So we've recently done a little baby who was three or four months old, but we do have a very experienced surgeon and even we were quite quite anxious about that baby, but we're hoping the outcome is going to be very good. So with hemispherectomy, it depends on um, the, you know, your, 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 your surgical unit and how early you can possibly do it. Okay, we have another question about the... <clears throat> someone is asking about that sometimes there is auditory processing they can mimic adhd uh, and they ask you would they need to be screened separately and treated separately so i think um most of us probably struggle to get good access to psychology but it's really really helpful so that's where the team approach comes in so if you work together with an educational psychologist or a neuropsychologist it's really useful to help um to to differentiate some of these disorders that are not not very easy to distinguish just on a standard clinical screening. Not all of us also have the, the expertise that the psychologists have. So I think that's where a team approach would come in very helpful. Hmm. So I have a question for you. Uh, some, clinici uh, some clinicians use antipsychotics or neuroleptic drugs to decrease the irritability and try to control the outrage attacks of those patients with ADHD. Do you prefer the use of some of them because most of the uh, uh, antipsychotics drugs decrease the seizure threshold for some patient? Mm. <clears throat> so I've seldom had to use, I, I think we do use risperidone um, fairly frequently in our patients who've got epilepsy and very challenging behavior. Um, we're fairly cautious with the doses. So I think whatever one's using an agent um, what I tend to do is start with a very low dose and then walk, work it up slowly. One does have to be careful um, because one can, um, one can have problems with seizure control, uh, but it's often a balance and very difficult, very challenging behavior can uh, cause havoc with family life and, and family relationships. So my first priority would be to control the seizures and having controlled the seizures then to try and address the behavior and look at what was triggering the behavior. So to see whether there were any other perhaps behavioral mechanisms that one could use. It's very often the children who also have autism as opposed to just straight ADHD, I think, who, who one's finding this very explosive behavior. And so, so making sure that you've identified exactly what the behavioral phenotype is and then trying to target a specific behavior. Some of the behaviors may be able to be managed behaviorally and otherwise you, you may have to try one of these drugs such as risperidone um, to see if you can control the symptoms. Okay. We have Dr. Abdullah Bahrani. He is raising his hand. It's okay, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rigor Al-Biradin, for your uh, nice uh, coverage of the subject. And thank you, Dr. Al-Badri, for your, for your kind moderating of the session. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I have uh, one uh, question for uh, Dr. Yoran regarding, regarding the uh, family uh, conception and perceptions of the epilepsy and uh, the extent of the effect of the family perceptions on, on the behavioral disturbance on the baby. Uh, 
uh, the, the second question is one which is raised by Dr. Anwar regarding the anti-epileptic and the family who is keeping concerning of the behavioral disturbance secondary to the uh, medications and keep looking for this. Uh, whenever we change the medication, they keep looking for the side effect of the medications. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. I think I think what you've you're alluding to is that there a child is not a child alone. A child is part of a family, and so whatever is happening in the family involves the child. So, what you do find with children who have epilepsy or any serious chronic condition is that the family become extremely anxious, and it's that's why again I said we focused on anxiety in the patient, but very often the mother, the father are extremely anxious. So, and that can cause behavioral worsening in the child. Either the parents become overprotective and they don't allow the child to perhaps go through their normal developmental exploratory stages and to sort of, you know, anything that, that seems slightly threatening, the child will be protected against. And, and that that's difficult. It's very understandable that pa parents might behave that way. But uh, what we want is for our children with epilepsy as far as possible to have a normal life as far as they can while we protect them. So I think considering what what's going on in the family, talking to parents and, and getting in, again, we often get in only one parent, often it's only the mother, um, and then she goes home and, and the family, everybody gives her advice or tells her something different or says the doctor doesn't know this. So it becomes very complicated. So there is a place sometimes to get the family in and have a good talk with them so that everybody can tell you, this is what they think and, and why isn't it this? And so, and the same applies to medication. So I think we need to be very cautious when we are prescribing and to listen to patients, but you're right there are some families that they read all the side effects and every medication you give their child will have something on the list so again I think it's a case of sitting down um, trying to allay the anxiety discussing the balance there's no you know you could give placebo but you wanting to give something that's actually effective and in order for you to give that it it you you may have to have the risk of a side effect and then it's a case of how severe is that side effect and is it is it a permanent side effect is it something that's going to go away with time could you adjust the dose um it's really a process there isn't an easy one size fits all answer but it is acknowledging the parents anxieties and then seeing whether there are adjustments whether you've got wiggle room or not sometimes if you sit them down and you show them you know this is the protocol this is what your child has this is type of epilepsy and these are the medicines that we have available and then we'll try and treat these side effects um you know they, they understand so i think one needs to keep give the parents enough information that they don't feel too anxious but they also feel empowered that they know what's going on and they feel safe about their child Another question which was raised also in the Q&A is regarding the, when we need to treat, uh, if, if the symptoms is developed, uh, for example, if ADHD symptoms is uh, start raising, when we need to treat? Uh, <clears throat> so the suggested time to start screening is when the children start school. So for us, that's around about the age of six. There are obviously children who start with very active ADHD symptoms before that. So those children can be quite difficult because the methylphenidate uh, group of agents has often either not the same response or sometimes a paradoxical response in young children. So they are difficult to manage and we often co-manage those children with our developmental team. Um, and um, I think that that's a group where it's particularly important to kind of look at behavioral support for the family because the medication is a tricky route but we if we were if, if if a child has ADHD and ASD we would probably use very low dose risperidone in that group from school age if the if the problem is predominantly ADHD um, it's useful to screen sort of uh, and ADHD um, if it's there it tends to be there so I think uh, the problem that you may encounter is that um, either parents or teachers may downplay symptoms and then you see with time that actually this child's had a problem for quite a long time but nobody's really wanted to um, talk about it or 
or consider treatment for it. We all know that there's still some hesitancy around the use of methylphenidate, for instance. So I think there it's up to us to just kind of ask the questions, keep track of the children's school reports when they come to visit us and select your own screening tool, whatever you like to use. So there are a whole variety of ADHD screening tools and behavior screening tools that, that you could use to get collateral from the parent and the teacher and then take it from there. Okay, there is some question about the, the use of uh, deep brain stimulation and its uh, use in treatment of cognitive deficits or attention deficits in those children. So I think I'd have to pass that question over. I don't know if anyone else in the audience would like to answer it. Certainly not something that we do. I mean, we do DBS for particularly difficult conditions, but it's not something I've ever used for cognitive deficits. Yeah. So uh, you spoke about the methylphenidate and its use. What do you think about the use of methylphenidate when it has paradoxical effect in those patients with comorbid epilepsy and ADHD? So it's not, it's, it's the young children I was talking about. So the, the little ones, you know, the three, four-year-olds, not the children with ADHD and epilepsy who are at school. It usually is extremely effective in those children. So if you, in most cases, as I said, 60% at least will probably respond very well to methylphenidate and very few um, will have uh, <clears throat> seizures. So um I would motivate to use methylphenidate as we would for other children with ADHD and children with epilepsy that's stable in the school going age because you want to optimize their concentration. You want them to be able to get as much out of school as they can. So it can really play a very important role. So it's only the, the ones that I was talking about maybe not responding so well with the very young children. So say the three, four-year-olds, that's a very difficult group to manage. Um, when they when they have extreme hyperactivity. Okay. Also, Dr. Anwar raised a question about if we have a child uh, with epilepsy and his seizures, we are controlled with phenoparp or benzodiazepine or levetiracetam, and then he developed the manifestations of ADHD. What about the approach of this child? So if I had a child in phenobarbitone who developed symptoms of ADHD or developed hyperactivity, I would change phenobarbitone to something else. Um, it's much less likely that uh, carbamazepine or lamotrigin would induce hyperactivity. But if I thought the hyperactivity was a drug effect, I would change the drug. And phenobarbitone is by far the most likely drug to do that. And it, it can be extremely problematic hyperactivity. And if you can't reduce the drug and change it, then, then I certainly wouldn't use methylphenidate to treat phenobarb-induced hyperactivity unless I had my back against the wall and I could not get the child off. But uh, it's not a combination I would choose at all. So I would elect to remove the offending drug, but hopefully substitute it with a, with a drug that was both con able to control the seizures and then introduce methylphenidate if the child still had ADHD. But you've got to look at most children who have ADHD and epilepsy, the ADHD actually arises before the children have seizures. So it's there already. Um, so if it comes on after you've introduced a drug, then it's probably not, it's probably a drug related side effect rather than um, primary ADHD. Okay. There's another question by Dr. Raib. He asked about what do you mean by the word or the, the, the sentence ketogenic diet resistance in causation of cognitive decline? Uh, it was just that that um, a child who's, who, who has ongoing severe seizure disorders who can't be controlled by anything, including the ketogenic diet, is more likely to end up with a cognitive deficit. I mean, we, are, we find that a fair number of our refractory seizure disorders do stabilize with the ketogenic diet, um, but there are those who don't. And so it's, it's, it's not the ketogenic diet that's causing it. It's the, the, the very, very refractory seizure disorder. I think we have another question, but you mentioned something about it uh, previously about the use of risperidone and the optimal time to, to start to use it in children with epilepsy and ADHD at the same time. Again, I wouldn't, in the school age child, if it was ADHD, I wouldn't choose risperidone as my first choice. I would choose, if I had seizure, seizures reasonably controlled, I would choose methylphenidate. Um, because the treatment of ADHD really consists of methylphenidate as first line and then atomoxetine. And then it's, it's not, risperidone is not 
primarily a treatment for ADHD. So risperidone is, is brought in um, often if you've got a combination of autism, epilepsy and ASD. So it's a very commonly used medication when you've got um, challenging uh, behavior in children who are on the, on the autism spectrum. And occasionally, and I don't know that everyone would agree with this in the preschool child, if you really can't contain their behavior, but uh, risperidone has quite significant side effects. So I'm quite cautious when I use it. And, um, but there are situations where uh, a, a child just um, cannot be contained. And then I think there is use uh, a, a place for cautious use of it. But I wouldn't use it primarily for ADHD. Okay. There is another question about the side effect of weight gaining after use of some drugs to, uh, to improve the attention and decrease the hyperactivity in those children. What about your approach? So again, risperidone, so, but, but also, um, unfortunately, methylphenidate because of the up and down. So often when the children come off the drug, having been not hungry, they feel very hungry and they eat a lot afterwards. It's a challenge. I think we have to educate parents right from the beginning. So I always tell parents at the beginning, if I'm starting something, that she ask them to let me know. And I watch the weight um, and I, I advise them to eat healthily. And I think that's not you know, that's something that one can apply for every patient. It's important for all of us to develop healthy eating patterns, but one really needs to reinforce it. Um, the biggest problem I've had has been with Valparate, and I change the drug if the child's weight is escalating astronomically. Um, I saw a two-year-old this week who weighed 36 kilograms. I saw him for the first time, and he his weight was up on the height chart. So if we have weight, you know, the weight chart with the weights below the height chart. Well, the weight was on the height chart. And I think that's really, really important. That is a significant comorbidity that we have to try and address. And probably not only we as neurologists, we may not be the best people. We need to then help uh, get help from dietitians and, and nutritionists um, who can assist us with dealing with that. And we need to watch out, as I mentioned, for family patterns of overcompensating for illness. So again, as part of a protective thing, a lot of families will not wanting their children with epilepsy to go out in case they have a seizure and they hurt themselves. They won't want them to take part in sports. They won't want them to do a lot of healthy activities that children need to do because they're afraid. So we need to be aware of that and, and to give them advice about about the things that are safe, that they can do things, but they need to be supervised when they're doing it so that we don't encourage families to just keep the children inside watching TV and eating because that's a, another behavioral, probably very common behavioral effect that, that we don't really think about. And it's, it, becomes, it, it becomes a problem later. We have another raised question about the regressive dysphasia in those children with comorbid epilepsy and ADHD. About the aphasia in the, what, what was the question about? Sorry. The regressed dysphasia, regressed dysphasia after seizures following ADHD management. It's from Dr. Ahmed. If I'm True. Right. So, so, so you have a patient with ADHD who has seizures and aphasia following ADHD management. Yeah, I would think that 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 sounds very unusual. I would think that I don't know what the underlying condition is there. It doesn't sound as if he's referring to Landau Kleffner. So, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, I think there's certainly conditions that I, I may be unaware of, but it would be very unusual. I've never had a patient, fortunately, who's had such a complication of ADHD medication. I would caution everyone, though, if you're using ADHD medication, to use it very carefully and to familiarize yourself with it because, and to always start with a really low dose and to monitor what the effects are. Um, so that, uh, because I think when one gets into trouble, it's when you start using perhaps larger doses um, with, without having tried out smaller doses first. Now we have another question about stopping the anti-seizure medication in those children. Is there any special consideration other than uh, those patients with epilepsy only 
I don't think so. I think I would probably use the same guidelines that are used for epilepsy. So I've had quite a few children whose epilepsy has eventually uh, remitted, um, but who've continued to need um, treatment for ADHD. And then I take them off the anti-seizure medicines and continue with the ADHD medicines. I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Reardon, for your uh, very interesting lecture and uh, uh, answering the questions of the attendees. Dr. Pahrani, do you have any anything to say then? Thank you very much. Nothing to add. Uh, everything is clear. Thank you very much. It's been a okay. pleasure. Thank you. Just uh, for our attendees and the guests, I want to have uh, something to be said about the Global Health and Epilepsy Project database that provides a registry of existing epilepsy projects throughout Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, as well as in other regions in the world. It identifies information such as project location and institutional partners, project scope, funding sources, and volunteer needs. The database is quick and easy to complete. By submitting information on the project, you inform understanding of efforts that are occurring throughout the world to narrow the epilepsy treatment gap. The database will provide you an opportunity to learn from others and to explore collaboration opportunities that might strengthen your own work as well as that of the sector. Furthermore, the database will allow people from different areas such as government, academia, non-profit organizations or philanthropy to learn about existing efforts while offering a means to engage. Finally, I would like to tell all the attendees, I would like to thank them uh, so much. And I want to say uh, uh, you can have your certificate of attendance by scanning in the next slide, yeah, uh, by scanning uh, this barcode or QR code. And also there is a link in the chat box through which you can have your certificate. Again, I would like to ask the team of International League Against Epilepsy, and I would like to uh, thank our uh, speaker, Dr. Reardon, and uh, uh, thank the attendees. It was very nice uh, to meet you all. Thank you so much.